To begin looking at immunotoxicology and NIBS, let's first hear an introduction about NIBS from a Radio 4 programme. South Mims service station is an unlikely setting for one of Britain's best kept science secrets. But just a short hop away from the constant stream of lorries is the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control. Along with the rest of the British population, you've probably never heard of it. Actually, NIBS, as it's called, is world famous. It has many roles. Guardian of the world's medicines, frontline defence against global pandemics, and with its extraordinary collection of experts, universal scientific problem solver. Indeed, many think that NIBS ranks with the BBC's World Service as one of Britain's great gifts to the world. Before looking at a paper entitled Immunotoxicology Opportunities for Non-Animal Test Development, let's quickly look a little bit more at what NIB says about immunotoxicology on its website. This slide reads, Our focus is on the safety and mechanisms of action of pharmacologic agents and treatments that regulate or modify the immune response and the pathological role of the immune system. This includes immunomodulatory drugs. These are drugs that either stimulate the immune system, uh, the TGN1412 would be an example of that, or if they don't stimulate the system, they, they damp down the system, they suppress the system. And of course, if you have um, a heart transplant or something like that, the body tends to reject it. So you would give drugs to suppress the immune system, therefore avoiding rejection of a transplanted organ. Anyway, it goes on. They're looking at uh, monoclonal antibodies, as I've mentioned, vaccines, clinical transplantation, i.e. kidney transplants and things, and transfusion, blood transfusion, acquired immune deficiency disease, which is AIDS, so look at that as well, and adverse drug reactions to therapeutics such as TGN1412. That's all I'm going to say about NIBS in this episode. We're going to look at NIBS in much more depth in later episodes, i.e. biological vaccines and NIBS and biological non-vaccines and NIBS. But for the time being, we're going to leave NIBS and we're going to go and look at this paper that I mentioned earlier. The paper can be found in ATLA, i.e. Alternatives to Laboratory Animals, Volume 37, Number 4, September 2009. And it's page 387, which you can see at the bottom of this slide. And its title, as mentioned previously, is Immunotoxicology Opportunities for Non-Animal Test Development. The summary of this article gives a very good impression of what the state of affairs is at the moment as regards immunotoxicology and non-animal test methods. So I think I'll read it out from the beginning. It reads, At present, several animal-based assays are used to assess immunotoxic effects such as immunosuppression and sensitization. The use of whole animals, however, present several secondary issues, including expense, ethical concerns, and relevance to human risk assessment. There is a growing belief that non-animal approaches can eliminate these issues without impairing human safety, provided that biological markers are available to identify the immunotoxic potential of new chemicals to which humans may be exposed. Driven by the Seventh Amendment to the EU Cosmetics Directive, the new EU policy on chemicals, the REACH system, proposals to update the European legislation on the protection of animals used in research, and emerging visions and strategies for predicting toxicity, such in vitro methods are likely to play a major role in the near future. The realisation that the immune system can be the target of many chemicals, resulting in a range of adverse effects on the host's health, has raised serious concerns from the public and within the regulatory agencies. Hypersensitivity and immunosuppression, 
Uh, we've looked at both of those. Hypersensitivity, most of the uh, examples in this paper come under skin sensitization, so I suggest you go back and look at that episode. And immunosuppression, a lot of that has been covered in hematotoxicity, that episode. Anyway, hypersensitivity and immunosuppression are considered the primary focus for developing in vitro methods in immunotoxicology. Like I say, we have looked at those in other episodes. Anyway, it goes on. However, in vitro assays to detect immunostimulation, uh, we're going to look at that later, but if you stimulate the immune system, say with the monoclonal an antibodies, that's what that means. So obviously you have to look at the side effects from that, because as we saw from TGN1412, you, you know, you can have devastating side effects. And autoimmunity. Uh, I don't know much about this, but say some drugs and chemicals can lead to multiple cirrhosis or Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis is another autoimmune disease. Anyway, that's what they're just saying there that we you know we have to check that chemicals and drugs don't cause autoimmunity problems. So it goes on. This review of the state of the art in the field of in vitro immunotoxicity reveals a lack of cell-based immunotoxicity assays for predicting the toxicity of xenobiotics toward the immune system in a simple, fast and economical and reliable way. So we can see that at the moment, this field of non-animal alternatives is slightly immature. This slide reads the immunogenicity of biologicals. Immunogenicity equals or means the ability of a substance to provoke an immune response in the body of a human or an animal. Uh, we're going to have to... Uh, say what biologicals are here. I didn't think I'd have to do it to the next episode, but here is a definition of what scientists mean by biologicals by going back to the Radio 4 program on the National Institute of Biological Standards. So here is their definition. We deal with biological medicines. Stephen Ingalls, Director of the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control. Biological medicines are medicines made from cells, from tissues, and they are different from normal medicines because they're much more complicated. They're much more complex in their structure. A biological medicine would be, for example, a vaccine that's made in cells. And that would be hugely more complicated than, say, paracetamol. And because of that, it needs to be treated differently, it needs to be analyzed differently, it needs to be measured differently. So now we've defined all the words that are, um, are generally unfamiliar to the general public. Let's read what this slide says. It reads, The categorization of the immunogenicity of therapeutic proteins is of vital importance in the development and marketing of biotechnology products. Therapeutic proteins it usually means uh, antibodies, like the TGN1412. So that's what they mean by that. It goes, the consequences of immune reactions to a therapeutic protein range from the transient appearance of antibodies without any clinical significance to severe life-threatening conditions. That was what happened at the Norwick Park incident. It goes on. Obviously, the predictive value of animal models for the evaluation of therapeutic protein immunogenicity is low due to the inevitable immunogenicity of human proteins in animals and vice versa. Therefore, an appropriate strategy for the development of adequate screening and confirmatory assays to measure immune responses against therapeutic proteins is essential. In 2007, the European Medicines Evaluation Agency drafted new guidance on the immunogenicity assessment of biologicals, which was adopted by the EMEA in 2008. In the same year, a working method for constructing a risk assessment plan for the undesirable immunogenicity of biotechnology products, based upon experience of diverse product types, 
was presented to the regulatory agency. So what this slide is basically saying is that animals do not predict very accurately what uh, biologicals, especially the therapeutic proteins, are going to do in humans because of the massive differences between the two species. So therefore they're saying that there is a real need to find other methods to evaluate and predict how these proteins are going, the therapeutic proteins are going to behave in humans. We know animal models don't predict what therapeutic proteins are going to do in humans because of the Norwich Park incident. In that incident, the monoclonal antibody TGN1412, which had been tested in several animals at very high doses with no bad reactions, reacted very badly in the human volunteers who took it for the first time. It's just one example, but with that example, we have to worry about using animals to predict what new therapeutic proteins are going to do in the future. I'm going to finish this episode by looking at this last slide. It reads, There is a clear need for continued investment in the development of methods and approaches that will permit the relevant and reliable identification in vitro of any potentially immunotoxic compounds. And the conclusion reads, Despite the limitations of the in vitro methods, much progress has been made over the last decade in the development of in vitro alternatives to assess immunotoxicity, that is, both immunosuppression and hypersensitivity. This progress justifies the use of such models in the pre-screening of direct immunotoxicants. However, even though the progress made has been promising, scientists will be under considerable pressure to have fully validated assays implemented in time to meet the up-and-coming EU regulatory deadlines.